praise the Lord. Well, let me say good evening to all of you. Amen. And I welcome you to our Bible study. We are glad you taking time to stay with us. It's good God. Bible study. And so we welcome all of you. Before we go any further, we want to pray and ask God's blessings on our time here this evening. Let us pray. Dear God in heaven. We are eternally grateful that you have saved us. We were lost in sin. We were going to a lost eternity. But the goodness of God, which leads men to repentance, gripped our hearts. We thank you for the opportunity that we can confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, as we continue as your disciples, as we study your word, Father, open your word to us. Give us insight. But more than that, when you speak to us, help us to heed and to do what is written therein. We must become more than just hearers of the word of God. Help us to do, Father. Bless all those who will be listening in person via the worldwide web. Thank you for today. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. 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 Well, welcome all of you. Thank you. The crowd is growing and we are seven. And I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome those online, but actually I want to see uh, Facebook. I don't know if there are others who are present, but you let me know. Dr. Lewis is online. Welcome to you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for viewing. Are you enjoying your holidays. Sister Sun is online. Welcome. Sister Hannah Peer is online. How are you doing? Welcome. Uh, who else? Well, those are the persons I'm seeing for now. Any others on YouTube? No, not as yet. All right, so welcome. Welcome to all of you. We are coming to you from the Pentecostal Lighthouse Tabernacle, the member church of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies. Amen. Sister K. Melissa, how are you doing? Good evening. You're welcome. All right. We have been for approximately what, five months, six months, in understanding the kingdom. And we also have been simultaneously in Bible study, studying the book of Matthew according to Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And we have noted from the very, very beginning that Matthew is what we call the gospel that speaks a lot about the kingdom. And uh, so that is why we chose that book, that gospel, to study. And so we are looking at it. Um, it is always refreshing that it doesn't matter how long you've been in Christ and how the entire Bible. Last year, I purpose in my heart to read the Bible from cover to cover. By the grace of God, He helped me and I did it. But it doesn't matter how many times you've done so. Whenever you read the Word of God, you get something fresh. If you're honest with yourself, that's because this Word is living, it's active. And the Holy Spirit is there to illuminate this word to you. And so that's the beauty of the word of God, is it not? It is not boring. If you really study it, it will take all eternity and leave. Amen. And I really believe in line upon line, here a little, there a little, taking my time going through uh, the word of God. And I believe you understand it better when you do it like that. Take time rather than peace, peace. All right, and so we are looking at the gospel according to Matthew. It's the sixth month of the year, and we haven't passed chapter five yet. So it means the end of the year, seven months. Well, it's the sixth month in terms of when I said, oh, good. But thank you very much, my dear people. And, um, uh, the, and it's amazing how we are only at chapter five. That means if we continue Matthew, just a portion. We we'll finish the year and still not finish Matthew. That's one book, you know. And we have what? Six to five. Lord have mercy. 
so we can share from God's word for all eternity. Today I want to begin a series, and, and, and actually Dr. James Embry White would have done a lot of research in it, so I give him credit uh, uh, for this area. But I want to begin looking at the Beatitudes, now that we have looked at them, and, and juxtaposed, well not even juxtaposed, but transposed them, maybe, up to the 21st century. And look to see, because one of the things we ought to be doing all the time is make the Bible relevant to us. It is relevant. But we have to look for the connections, look for the connectivities. What's, what is what God is saying to Marie? Welcome. And Lincoln, welcome to you. So, the 21st century, Brother Ashton, you have it there? And the Beatitudes. We want to see uh, is Jesus' message still relevant to now? This is mine. But, uh, but what he has said in Matthew, is it relevant? That's what I wanted. We are, we are reading, we'll be from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. That's an entire block there. 13 to 16. Yes? And um, that's where we are. We take our time. I believe all will concur with the statements that we want our lives to count. Is that true? We all want our lives to come. Come on, amen. We want to. And so, you don't want to live this life and then just pass on, you know. Incidentally, I was listening, but somebody sent me a video of the Reverend Al Charter. And I was listening to the good Reverend. And he was preaching at churches in America, the Baptist church, I think. Interesting. He said it's so difficult to preach at the funeral when somebody has not lived the kind of life uh, that would warrant accolades being mentioned. You know, when I saw a manner of nice things. But it, you know, as you live, so you die. As you live, so you die. And that's why we have to do things bigger than ourselves. Uh, before we depart this part so we can be remembered. But anyway. We want It must affect you when we have become so cavalier, nonchalant, as though it doesn't matter what happened and we don't care. It's almost as if we don't care anymore. One particular example I use, there's so many young men who are in prison and they are there. Man, that when they're kids, people have given up. Are you making any? Am I? What are you doing? What are you doing? I remember this woman who left her lovely house in California or somewhere in America. This woman in her uh, what? Left her. Get 
bedroom bouts. To go where? When she left and she went, she said, Life. And when I look at the Beatitudes, I realize what Jesus had to say, what he had to say, I wanted to know what he had to say on influence, making a difference, difference making, living a life of significance. What Jesus, mean, the kind of person whose presence is felt in this world, I'll be talking about one or two of them. He changed the course of destiny. I love to watch history. I love history. I believe Christians must, you know, especially preachers, we must make our knowledge rounded. We mustn't just stick to one thing. We must understand world history. We must read a lot and expand our knowledge. Let me read what Jesus and it's going to seem tame on the surface. But when we unpack what he's saying, oh, we're going to see the teeth inside of it. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 5. From verse 13. You are the what? Read for me. You are the salt of the earth. Oh God. But if salt, if the salt loses its saltness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer what? Good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. That's all? Yes. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill, I'm reading, I think this might be the NIV. Well, let me read from my thing. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a pet measure, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light. I can't hear you. In such a way that they may want to see your good works and do what? Elder, our Father, glorify Him. Not us, glorify Him. He takes the glory. How do you become a person of influence? That is, I'm a, that is what I'm, I'm probably going to major my life. I'm studying this thing about influence. I think years ago I stopped at purpose, Brother Otis, but now I've moved on. So we used to talk a lot about discovering your purpose. Now I think the next level is, is influence. When you discover your purpose, that is to what? When you now know why you're supposed to be here, that must be to influence your sphere. Is that true? How do you become a person of influence? Jesus says, you become the salt of the earth. And the what? And the light of the world. Therefore, Barashtan, number one, we're going to look at salt of the earth. We are going to look at the salt of the earth. Here we go. Let's start off with salt. I think I explained a little bit of it, and I'm glad we are the teachings are intertwined and interlocking because on Sunday we spoke about salt. In Jesus' day, we are going to repeat, salt was one of the most useful and important elements you could possess. But it not only was important because of what it did for the taste of seasoning of food. In fact, in Jesus' day, this wasn't even salt's primary use. Back then, the main use for salt was as preservative, desert condition. They didn't have refrigerators or freezers. You know, in Guyana, in certain parts, the Amerindians still do this, you know. Oh yeah, I visited them. I did a lot of missionary work in Guyana, anyhow. When 
you visit among those people, they still put their meat outside. Dries the meat with the sun and they salt it. They didn't have freezers or refrigerators. They, you couldn't buy things in cans. So they used salt to keep the meat from spoiling or the food. So for example, if you had a piece of meat that they couldn't eat right away, you take some salt and rub it into the meat. Is that all you do? And that salt, if rubbed in, will keep the meat from decaying. There's a show called um, Living in Alaska, is it? And you would see them. They hunt, they kill, and they preserve the food in that way. Rub the salt in it. And it will keep it from going bad, as the point. So when Jesus said, you see the analogies he's using? When Jesus said that we should live a life that was like salt to the earth, he meant that we should live in such a way that our very presence in the world acts like salt. Hello, your very presence acts like salt. There's a book that came out by the writer. Alan Wiseman, Wiseman, and it is called The World Without Us. Listen, the book is called The World Without Us, Us. And Wiseman explored humanity's impact on the planet by asking us to envision this thing, envision an earth without the ongoing presence of people. Think for a second. Envision the earth without the ongoing presence of people. It's a fascinating book. But if you find it, in it you will find, you'll find out how our massive infrastructure collapse and finally, and finally vanish without human presence. How just days after humans disappeared, Disappeared. Floods in New York's subways would erode, start eroding the city's foundation. I was looking at something and the man, the, the engineer was saying, those people in Florida, especially Florida, they're building close to the sea. Everybody wants beach front. But even the engineer and, and, and the marine biologists, they were saying to them, listen, this, this thing is sinking. And, and, and one day, these all these buildings will topple. But of course, it's exotic to build next to the sea. Oh, Dubai has gone crazy with that. Dubai has built islands on the sea. So they packed uh, 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 the, the sea so much, Brother Stephen. And so now they come, people bought those things, you know. And they're living uh, on very close to the sea. Well, just days after, according to the book, humans disappeared, disappeared. floods in New York subways would start eroding. The city's foundation. The other day I saw rain, it rained, something happened. And in the subways in New York, it flooded. And how, as the world's cities crumbled, asphalt, jungles would give way to real ones. This book is fascinating. And here's a short visual, Ashton, of what would happen. You know what I mean? So, well, but I'm going to wait for it. So if you can cue it up for me. But this writer is showing us a fascinating look into what would happen. Could you imagine if people were to disobey the world without, without our presence? I want you to see it. So we're going to try to cue it up from um, 48 to up there. The, the signal. And uh, two minutes and so on, we will look to see well, what would happen if people were to disobey the world without. It's fascinating. And then as we come back, I'm going to show you what would happen if all Christian influence, hello, 
What will happen to your community? If Christian influence were to withdraw from the world tomorrow, what happens? If we wake up tomorrow morning and every Christian influence is withdrawn, what do you think this world will look like? What will this world look like? No more Christians, no more influence, no more godly influence. What will the world look like? Got it? How long would it be before the world felt the effects if no salt was being applied? What would happen if we don't have church people? Well, forget that. Disciples of Jesus and their presence in the world. It's a frightening thing. As John Stott once wrote, that the world is what? Putrefying. John Stott says the world is putrefying. In other words, the world cannot stop itself from going bad. We live in a time, as I told you on Sunday, where, I mean, it has served its purpose. All the behavioral sciences are, are being employed as the answer to our problems. I would look at Dr. Phil sometimes and I marvel. People with all kinds of problems go to Dr. Phil and he solves them all. All kinds of problems. People with sexual addictions, he sends them to some home. What I want is a peek into that home and want to know what is the therapy. But he sends them to a home and then they come, they spend a month and they're good. They come back and they, they okay, they don't need God, they don't need all this thing about um, serving Jesus. All they need to do is go away and some people will ask them a few questions and put a few tips and so on. And they are okay back into society. Is it true? I was talking to my son, and he was saying to me, you know, Daddy, um, and those things can only, um, they can't even diagnose exactly all the time. But there's some things they have no answers for. No. No. What would happen? The world, according to John Stock, is putrefying. It can't stop itself from going bad. We seem to be moving from one bank to the next. Do you know every time you think that it is over, you can't see anything worse, Brother James? By the time you wake up, something worse has happened. When you think about it, I cannot understand what would cause a man, Brother Stephen, when he was a young man, to leave his hometown with an AR-15 rifle. What would cause a young man to do that and travel how many miles to go where he's never called, he's not wanted? And then open fire on people and kill them. And then he got off in the courts of law. It's called self-defense. What would cause a young man to pick up a weapon? Recently I saw another man who drove past, I think, a clinic or something. And decided just to shoot at the clinic. And video himself shooting at the clinic. The world has gone crazy. There's a song when I was growing up. His old time singers, what's the matter with the world? Has the world gone mad? And the man answered himself by saying, nothing is wrong with the world. It's just the people. That's it. And, and that great um, singer, what's his name? The one who died, Teddy Pendergrass, uh, asked the question in a song. What's going on? Well, Teddy has a way he shouted you, turn on the lights. <laughs> but Teddy said, what's going on in this world? What is happening in this world? You look around. It cannot stop itself from going bad. Only salt introduced from outside can do this. Only salt introduced from outside can do this. The church is set in the world as sought to arrest or at least to hinder what? The process of social 
decay. Oh, I need to say that again. The church is set in the world for that express purpose to stop or at least hinder the process of social decay. We are decaying socially rapidly. We have lost morality in many cases. We have lost our sense of right and wrong. People are not saying and they are being taught that right or wrong is subjective. It's relative. It's called relativism. It is up to you to determine your own truth. People do not believe when they're being taught there isn't anything such as objective truth bigger than yourself. You don't believe that. I determine what is right or wrong. I determine. The church was put to arrest the decay. We are decaying socially. Relationship wise. Listen. Listen. Recently, so many murders took place in one weekend. I never forget. It seems as if five at that time when I saw in this pin island, 500 plus murders for the year. What you don't understand is when you have a population of 1.2 people dying in a year, I wonder. Something is wrong. We are decaying. And it's as if sometimes it doesn't bother some people. Oh, it's just another one. It's just another one. And it looks like we are going towards that again. We are decaying socially. God intends the most powerful of all restraints without sinful society to be as redeemed, regenerate, and righteous people. God intends the most powerful of all restraints within society. Christian people should be people who know how to restrain themselves. Thessalonians call the Holy Spirit the restrainer. We should know how to restrain ourselves. We have God on our side. Those who have been redeemed, those who have been regenerated, righteous people. Now, I think most of us don't for lives can do much to keep the world from decaying. A lot of us don't think, what can I do? Most of us don't think that our lives can do much. A young man in class, anything today, he will say, what can I do? I'm just a small man. I don't have the rank to change anything. And I had to talk to him. Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change that you want to see. So the change starts with me. Hello. Most of us don't think. Is that it, sir? Yeah. Could we stop it? And... Yeah. I'm ready to do. Volume? Yeah. Oh, whatever they have to Yes, so I'm ready. So we look at that video now. The world without us video. And see what would happen. If all the presence of people would be removed from the earth. Go ahead. Power out. Within a few hours of humans leaving Earth, most fossil fuel power stations would shut down as they started running out of fuel. Some wind-driven turbines may continue to provide energy, but without maintenance from humans, eventually they will also fail as would unmaintained solar panels, rendered useless as dust and debris mounted upon them. It would only be hydroelectric plants that would continue to run, but within a month or so, these would also shut down. The knock-on effect of losing What if one day, the 7.5 billion people on this planet suddenly disappeared? Now we've talked about some instances where this could have happened in the past, or how we could one day become extinct, so this isn't a fantasy discussion, it's real. What if a huge nuclear war broke out, or what if everyone just took off to another planet? Just what would happen to the Earth over time without our influence? 
While here are some good and some bad things that would happen if just one day humans completely vanished. Sit back and admire the beauty of Mother Nature and what she would do without us interfering. Power out. Within a few hours of humans leaving Earth, most fossil fuel power stations would shut down as they started running out of fuel. Some wind-driven turbines may continue to provide energy, but without maintenance from humans, eventually they will also fail. As would unmaintained solar panels, rendered useless as dust and debris mounted upon them. It would only be hydroelectric plants that would continue to run, but within a month or so, these would also shut down. The knock-on effect of losing power across the world would be pretty catastrophic, and makes you realise how dependent on it we've become. Anything requiring power would fail. Within days, food from fridges and freezers would start to rot, as would anything else deep frozen or cooled. This includes precious scientific research samples, as well as carefully preserved ancient artefacts that depend on working environmental systems to protect them. Think Egyptian mummies, and even the wax statues at Madame Tussauds. Most of the world's underground systems would flood due to the pumps that continually pump out water, and within a week, Persons. Now, we stopped at where we said most of us don't think that our lives can do much to keep the world from decaying. We tend to think that the individual acts of ordinary people are not that important. So what can I do? So the idea of our role in preventing societal decay and thus making a difference with our life. We don't take it very seriously. We just come, we live. Well, what do you want me to do? I'm just a young man, I'm just a young woman, I'm just working for my salary. What do you want me to do? I don't have the kind of influence, I don't have the clout, I don't have the education, I don't have the position. That's for people like Martin Luther King Jr. That's for people like Nelson Mandela. Not me. That's for them. We are so wrong if you're thinking like that. I hope you know those people suffered a great deal if I can tell you about this story. Of the time, uh, uh, years in prison. By the way, not too many people knew and know that he was an eminent lawyer. He studied law. Not too many people know that. And he came out of prison. It's a different world in South Africa. Martin Luther King Jr., a young man, 1968. The bullet tore the left side of his entire face. He didn't want his wife to see him. His father collapsed in the church. He was the lead pastor of the church. Dr. King was the assistant pastor. Why should my young son die? Sometimes you look at life now in America, 60 something years after his death, and you wonder whether he died in vain. Because some of the same things he fought for, people are still. But if you think that is only for Dr. King, El Sumandia, we are so wrong. And Jesus wanted us to know we are so wrong. That's why he gave us the challenge to be what? So. He knew that that would matter most. He knew that that would matter most would be the countless, seemingly small acts. It's not the big things, but the small acts, such as yourself and such as I am, that would make a cumulative difference. Small acts. You don't have to do great things, big things, and big scale, and our names. Maybe. We will never have a holiday in our name. That's fine. But it's, Jesus knows it's the very small acts. And he's absolutely right. And you see this played out in the most basic of social studies. The small things that we do matter. Do you know that? The small things. In the 1980s, let's look at some history. 
in the news. New York City was in the grip of one of the worst crime epidemic in history. How many talking about back then? In the 1980s. I went to my friend in the Bronx not too long ago. Let me tell you, in the Bronx, you didn't want to go to the Bronx in those times. It was in the worst crime epidemic. But then suddenly, without warning from a high in 1990, the crime rate went into a dramatic decline. Murders dropped by two thirds. Felonies were cut in half. What happened? The most intriguing idea as to why why things decrease in New York is called the broken windows theory. The broken windows theory. And that is the brainchild of the criminologist James Q. Wilson, criminologists, and George Kelly. You know what they argue? Oh, this doesn't sound like a Bible message. You know what they argue? These criminologists. And I really believe in we must have experts who must explain things to us. These criminologists, they argue that crime is inevitable, is the inevitable result of disorder. They argue that crime is the inevitable result of disorder. Wait a minute, let's look at the analogy. They said if a window is left, if a window is broken and left unrepaired, people walking by will conclude that no one cares and no one is in charge. Soon, more windows will be broken. And the sense of anarchy will spread from the building. It will spread to what? To the streets on which it faces, sending a signal that anything goes. Hmm. The idea is that crime is what? What is the idea? That crime is contagious. Crime is contagious. It can start with a broken window and it can spread to an entire community. It can start with a broken window and it can spread to an entire community. Which means that what? What matters? Listen carefully. What matters is the little things. And you know what? We don't take time in the Caribbean. Little things. We pass them along the way. That don't matter. Leave it alone. The little things matter. The other day I was driving and I saw someone unwrap something in the content on the inside. Do you know what that person did with the paper? You got it right. What am I talking about? The little things we don't concern ourselves about. Why are you just discarding it in the public places? Have you ever seen what happens when there is flood? Have you ever seen the content in the water? You see all manner of stuff, stove, fridge. You want to know what is really happening in this place. Because we don't take time with the little things, the small things. There is a scripture in the Bible as I'm going. And I remember there's a scripture that says, it is the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. Not the big ones, but the small ones. The idea is that crime is contagious. And it can start with a broken window. And it can spread to an entire community. And that means that what matters is little things. Little, little things. Do you know what matters? A little stand. Little stands. Little stands to the spread of crime. If we begin to do little stands. Little stands. Not big ones, just small ones. And that is exactly, Brother James, what, how the New York City addressed the problem, the war was waged on what? On broken windows. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? The war was waged on broken windows. In other words, the war was waged on what? The little things, Sister Morris. The war was waged on graffiti on the wall. If we catch you writing and defacing our property, we will deal with you. But in this part of the world, that's small things. Leave it alone. But what you don't understand, when you start small, you graduate step by step. Oh God, have mercy. Have you ever seen a child, if you don't stop certain things when they start, it grows into a mountain. Then they get disrespectful to you. Now you want to stop. It's too late. You should have, what would they say, a parent in the elder? We have nipped it in the one. Yeah, 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 don't wait. But in this part of the world, a man, a doctor, was giving a testimony. He went to England. You got a ticket. Just in case you got a ticket for breaking the traffic lights, yeah? You know, we are bosses at that. We just break traffic lights with impunity. The light could be red three seconds people trying to do the traffic lights. But he broke, he came from the Caribbean and broke the traffic light over there. But what happened? He kept on driving because he did not see physical policemen and women on the street. But what he didn't realize is that in those countries, Big Brother is watching at you. The eye is England, he came back home. He, went, he returned to England. Hello, at the airport. Imprinted on that computer screen when they plug in his name. It came up. You have a ticket to pay. You cannot enter. He thought he could get out of it. It's in there because they recorded it in the system. I was asking my, my sister in law, she says, Listen, you can't get away from anything in England where she lives. And police don't come behind you in Birmingham. She said, you will see in your mailbox the next day a ticket. Because the cameras already picked up your license plate, everything. 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 That's how we're changing in New York. Wage war on little things. Little things matter. On graffiti. Focusing on the subways. The cleanup took from 1984 to 1990. It soon spread to the entire city. Seemingly. Little things they started to talk about. Little things such as stopping, torn style jumping on subways. Have you ever been in a train in America and see people flicking and you try to reach home safe and they jumping all over? You people crazy? But nobody says anything about your head. You don't look at it. You say nothing about your head. Getting rid of the squeezy or squeaky man who came up to drivers at intersections. Cracking down on public drunkenness and littering. The little things we're going to start with. In other words, they took care of that. And when they started to pay, uh, pay special attention to the little things, the crime began to fall across the city. See, when people know they can get away with things, yeah. they'll do it. They'll do it. And this is what Jesus was after. Wow, this is not a lesson in criminology. I'm just trying to use the analogy. This is what Jesus was after. What was he after? When we live our lives as salt. When we live our lives as salt. What happened? It impacts the world around us in disproportionate measure. It impacts people. And Brother Stephen, you get it. It doesn't have to be big things. It's a little gesture to your neighbor. Come oh, on. It's a little gesture that will go a long way. We are the mended windows. We are the scrub of graffiti. The church. Is the one that Jesus left to ensure and try to stop or hinder social decay. Listen to me. Sister Melanie survives, but make no mistake. It's acting out in little ways that leads into the big events. 
acting out in little ways. I wanted to stop the vehicle and say to that gentleman, why do you think you can discard a piece of paper? And we do it with impunities as if, who do you think is going to pick it up? Why do you think you can just discard? There's a sickening thing in the Caribbean that aggravates and irritates the living daylight out of me. And that is men urinating in public. When are we going to stop that nonsense? People stop all over the place. It is terrible to speak well of us. But who's going to go give a ticket? Um, excuse me, sir. Uh, when you finish, I just want to talk to you. When you finish. Who's going to give a ticket? Have you? How many, a lot of you have traveled. It really is a sight to behold to see us. Sometimes even our little children, we have them doing the same thing. The little things. We are the scrubbed off graffiti. But make no mistakes. Acting in little ways lead to big events. To the big moments. To the big opportunities. If you can't be faithful in little things, you want God to give you big things to do. Little things. You know there's a man who said, He's an admiral for the Coast Guard, the American Coast Guard. And he was asked to give a speech at this graduation or whatever exercise. And he said, you want to change the world? Begin by looking your bed. Ooh, little things. You want to make your bed if you want to change the world. The little things don't just add up to big things. They can be seized by God and become big things. Mm. I heard a story of a 42-year-old woman who was on her way home from work on a cold December day. It was a day like no other day. Getting on a public bus. Hell no. She paid her fare and she sat. In the first vacant seat, she was just glad to sit because her legs were tired. And Miss Edgehill, as, as the bus filled with passengers, the driver turned around and told her that she would have to give up, get up and give up her seat. Come on now, think about what I'm talking about. And move to the back of the bus. Get up and give up. It was 1955 in America. She was black. And those seats were for whites. But that lady sat there and did not move. Little things. We have to be willing to stand for something or fall for anything. You have to be willing to stand for something. She did not move. She wasn't an activist. She wasn't a radical. Just a quiet, conservative, church-going woman with a nice family and a decent job as a scene stress. But hear me, she did move. Maybe it was just the injustice of it all. How could you see? I asked them that today. How could you see injustice and just little thing? Maybe it was the years of persecution. There's a time in this world women were not allowed to vote. Women were seen as second class citizens. And worse for race. Worse for race. Maybe it's the years of persecution and abuse that she, that woman there, and millions of others had suffered for no other reason than the color of their skin. Years of suffering. Suffering. A woman said, until the colors of a man are no more significant than the color of his eyes, there will be war. 
There will be war. There will be war. Maybe she was tired of being treated as a second class citizen. Having to drink from certain fountains. They were marked. You can't drink there. They had their things across there. Maybe she was tired. Maybe she was tired that she had to go to certain bathrooms. Maybe she was tired of being forced into certain schools. I don't know, but whatever ran through her heart and mind, one thing in that lady's mind, this thing that you're asking me to do is wrong, and I'm not moving. And she sat there quietly. You know, today, we, I said Sunday, we become so nonchalant. It's like Casey Rasser. They, some of us are Christians, we see things wrong. It's amazing stuff. It must bother you. It has to bother you. It must, it must bother you. You can't live in this world and be a disciple of Jesus. When you see things, it must bother you. So she just small little thing. What was the small little thing? She sat there. No big thing. She blow no horn. She, she just sat. Then the driver began yelling at her, telling her to move it. And then your pastor just began to yell at her, push at her, swear at her. But she, oh God, of course, she stayed right there, right where she was. So the driver stopped the bus. Watch at this. He stopped the bus. He got up and called the police. She moved him. You have to have a cat to move the lady. She moved When they arrived, what did they do? They hauled her off to jail. But what they didn't realize, they were hauling her off into history. They didn't realize that's what they were doing. Because that woman was Rosa Parks. When she took her stand for what was right, or rather, when she took her seat for what was right. The entire civil rights movement was ignited. Rosa Parks, a female. What about me? Simple. The woman never does a simple woman. She doesn't have any. She didn't get on that bus that day looking for trouble. The lady didn't do that. Or with a planned attempt to make some kind of political statement. Today, when people want to do things, they tell everybody before they do it. That blows apart. She didn't go on the bus for that. She just wanted to do what? To go home as everybody else. And as a Christian, which she was, Rosa Parks knew she was made in the image of God. You're not better than I am because of my skin color. She knew that she was fearfully. She knew she had what? Dignity and worth. I don't care what you say. I am, I am somebody. For a wonderful eternity filled moment, this woman was the salt of the earth. Just for a moment. Just for a fleeting moment. And that kind of moment, that kind of salt changes the world. It changes the world, friends. Brothers and sisters, you can be sought anywhere. You can be sought anywhere. Are you being sought where you are right now? And you should be. I mean, bring this down to the lowest level. Let's bring it down to the lowest level. You can be sought in your job. You can be sought in the marketplace. If you have a business, you don't rob people. You give them this, the exact pounds that they paid for. You can be sold in the checkout line at the grocery store. When last have you paid for somebody's grocery? Have you ever done that? It's going into a store and it's local. Or you're eating a meal and, and then the person gets up and about to pay and person said, no, 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 someone paid you already. What? You did that. You go on, you're not paid to the wrong to say, are you? You can be sold 
watch this now online, Lord Jesus, very young people. The things we post online, I, I am grossed out. And Christians involved in it, all they're doing is exhibiting how sexy they are. Clicks. What is wrong with us? Clicks. Look at me. I don't have any muscles, but you see my boy. Man. Yeah. And all we are posting are fleshly things online. When you stand before God, you will say, when I give you an opportunity, post the scripture. Do something with your life. Yeah. Tell somebody about Jesus. Instead, we are only posting us. You can be sought online with social media, with what you post on Facebook. And might I warn Christians and, uh, and help you out. Be very careful what you post and repost and borrow from other people and put on your status. Read before you post them. Not every thought is a good thought or a biblical thought. But anyhow. We see the oh, I like this. Some people post are filled with Gucci. Just brand name for oh God. For oh God. The last of you posted. Something that says you can be sought. You can be sought in your neighborhood. Where are you? You can be sought in your neighborhood. It's the only way you're going to make a difference. The people in your neighborhood, do they know you? Do they know you? And what do they know you for? What do they know you for? Do they, do they say, you know, there's somebody there that I can come and talk to? There's somebody there. There's a Christian that we can call upon. The Bible says, you are the salt of the earth. I don't want to go past that. I want us to take our time because it's, it's more than information. This has touched my own heart because I'm looking at my life and I'm wondering, have I been sought? Have I been influencing people? Am I truly a kingdom child? What happens in your people? A friend of mine, I want to stop there. We're not going to go on to light. I don't want to rush things. A friend of mine called. She said, you know, I want to ask you. She lost her mom. That's last week. Last week, Wednesday, I think it was, the funeral. And she said, I want to ask you. They're Catholic. She said, I want to ask you to do the funeral. Oh, how did I become friends? I taught her at Cipriani. She got me a job at the University of Western Indies Open Campus. And from then on, we've been friends. And so she called on me. She said, I want, I want to ask you. I don't have anybody to do it, but I want you to do it. What did I do? You know, I take to heart when people can call you and ask you to do something. It's a lot because they called me, I didn't call them. But Otis, I informed my class and I put it on hold because I was thinking this is an opportunity for me to be a witness. An opportunity to be a witness. And I went to that funeral. In between going to work, put a, put a thing on hold, pause. I will get up to y'all and come in. And I did that funeral. I so happened. She called and said, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You don't have to pay me. No, no, no. This thing is free. Thank you for coming. I want to be an influence. I want more. I'm glad she called me. She could have called anybody else. I'm glad she called. And I was able to preach the gospel to people I would not have otherwise met. That was a whole different group. Never met them before. All the relatives sitting there. Jesus said, be sought. Arrest the decay. I wish our young people in schools would arrest the decay of school. When I was in school, we had Bible study. And so I don't know what is happening now. We are so busy. We don't have time for God anymore. I went to university. And still preach the gospel. President of the Bible Club. 
Never give up on God because he never gave up on me. Still preach. Every midday, going and preaching the gospel. I'm still going to class. I wish, I wish that we would arrest the decaying schools. You see our schools today, many war zones. We are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. Bow your head. We are the salt of the earth. Are you being salt? What are you doing with your life? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. He expects us to stand in the gap, to arrest the moral decline, the decay that is taking place so rapidly. Every believer Every believer is called to be sought, is the melanin, sought, preserve. Where you are, preserve it. In your job, preserve it. In your community, preserve it. Every believer is called to be sought. Are we being sought? Are we doing what the unsaved is doing? Whatever is whatever. It doesn't concern me. I don't care. Let them kill themselves. When they're tired, they will finish. Is that what we're saying? Or are we saying, Lord, use me. Give me an opportunity to be sought tomorrow, Father. Give me an opportunity to be sought tomorrow morning. Send somebody my way so I can speak into that life. Give me an opportunity, oh Father. Many are going to lost eternity. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you as we reflect, we repent of our slothfulness. Maybe we have not been as effective in the kind of salt you want us to be. But we endeavor to be purpose in our hearts that we will, that we will by the help of the Holy Spirit, be sought and preserved. Thank you, Father. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you, even those online. Oh, God, thank you for their lives. As we continue in the earth, help us to represent you and represent you well. We give you the praise. We give you the thanks. In the name of Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. We want to thank you. All those who are viewing online, thank you very much, Sister Barato and Elder Barato. Thank you for joining. And all those, Sister Edgel and Guyana, thank you for joining. Sister Melanie, how are you doing? Doing your family, blessing to you and family. Thank you for joining, Sister Beverly Cummings. All of you, thank you. And go with this. Be soft for this entire week, the remainder of this week. May the Lord bless you. And keep you. Amen. And amen. Glory be to God.